Today we're going to talk a bit about the evaluation of projects and programs from a perspective of the project cycle and the policy cycle, in which we can see that there's a, it's kind of a circular reasoning behind this, that we have problems in society that emerge and we have groups in society that can identify those things as problems. These can be governors or society itself putting pressure on government to make policy that uh, responds to the problems that have been identified. And then in order to develop and define more clearly what needs to be done, we go through a, a series of steps in which we diagnose the problems and we try to raise awareness to formulate more clearly what would be the policy setting in which uh, the policy should be formulated. Then there may be some work to try to synthesize where the information that has been derived can provide a forecast of what will be the uh, results of adopting one policy over another, a comparison of the costs and benefits associated with that, and finally a decision in which a policy uh, is decided upon and is then implemented. Once the policy is implemented, we get to another stage, which is when we're trying to consider what should be the targets and goals of that policy once it becomes implemented. And against those targets and against those goals uh, are that we're going to conduct evaluation. So we don't really get much into evaluation in this cycle until we already get in, into the stage of implementation or nailing down more clearly what our specific objectives are and tying them down to timelines and numerical objectives. So we're going to have a policy evaluation at some stage following uh, the implementation in which there may be then a kind of adjustment over time when we see whether or not it is meeting the targets and objectives that have been set. That uh, whole cycle may then result in other problems arising. You may find that implementing one policy results in something else not being taken care of or something new comes up that hasn't been heard of before. At that point, we're going to have to start our cycle all over again with the problem identification, diagnosis, formulation, analysis, implementation, goals, evaluation, adjustment, etc. This is a cyclical process continuing over time. And it may be more important in terms of evaluation of the impact of policy or a project to adjust things as you're going along rather than design a project that's going to be perfect from the very beginning and you're just going to execute exactly as it's laid out. So how do we insert evaluation in the project cycle for it to be more effective? If we look at the first stage in that process, we're going to have in the identification and preparation phase, we're going to have an initial evaluation of the situation, both the past and the future, in terms of the context in which you're putting your policy or, or practice into play, and what are the expected impacts that uh, the proposed intervention is going to have. And you want to be able to try to measure those in some kind of readily monitorable uh, indicators. First evaluation will be done then once you have completed a detailed review of the feasibility, the efficacy, costs and benefits, and the impacts that can be had while you're in the phase still of designing the project. Call that a preliminary evaluation in which you're going to have a feeling of from your projections of what kind of impact you're going to have and the probability of, of those impacts actually being the way you are predicting. During the project's implementation, you are going to want to have a process of collection and analysis and monitoring of the information that is generated from beneficiaries, from the environment, and from the general conjunctural context within which your project is taking place is also going to impact on the feasibility of actually achieving the goals that you originally set out. If the economy tanks, you're going to be in a situation in which no matter how good your project may be, it just may not meet the goals because you don't have enough budget or you don't have enough demand from society for the benefits that are being extrapolated. 
you want to have a review then of the preliminary data that is generated during the process of implementation and looking also at the suppositions and assumptions that were used as the basis for arriving at the initial projections, leading to a clearer perspective on the future impacts that you might attain by implementing the project. And finally, we're going to get to a ex post uh, after the fact evaluation in which there's a, a revision uh, that can be done at the end in which you try to think about, well, we're going to continue this project, we're going to go to another intervention in which you're going to be more effective because we now know uh, what the effectiveness of this initial intervention was. I wanted to do a, a short application here to one area of policy intervention in which we are involved as part of our work with forests all over the world, and that's in Red Plus, the reduction of climate-related emissions associated with deforestation and degradation of forests. And we're trying to evaluate here how effective the interventions that we may be able to provide, be they payment for environmental services, be they better control over how people advance at the frontier into areas that should be protected from deforestation or the reforestation or restoration of forests that were there before that would be a part of our strategy for ensuring that forests are healthy and promote ecosystem service provision in the long term. So we're going to use different kinds of indicators and means of verification at different stages. And the stages of RED can be very much associated with what we call the forest transition curve. You have at different moments in the process of forest degradation a different strategy that should be adopted in terms of intervention to ensure those ecosystem services are provided by forests. If you're in the old growth forest, you may find that uh, it's not a great idea to promote activities that are going to replace forests. You want to promote activities that are going to help you protect the forest. What can you do to ensure that the people who live around the forest are going to reduce the pressure on the forest, avoiding the deforestation? Well, then maybe PES could be an option in this case. Whereas if you're in a degraded landscape, you may find that it's more important to invest in rest restoration according to a landscape perspective of how to uh, incentivize different users of, of uh, former forest land to protect the remnants that are still there to ensure natural recuperation takes place, or you have to invest in activities that substitute for degraded pastures or degraded soils can be quite expensive activities to reforest those landscapes. Different moments in the evaluation cycle may be necessary depending upon the point at which you are in the implementation of a, of, of a project. This table discusses uh, different moments in which you're uh, implementing a RED project. At the moment of initiating the process, you may have one kind of evaluation that is going to project what would be the returns from investing in forest protection in the long term based on your assumptions of what the kind of targets you're going to have. But during the process of implementation, you're going to have other indicators that are going to be necessary to, to be used to evaluate how well the process is going. In the input phase, you might be concerned about training people, about getting enough uh, staff into the, into the countryside to uh, monitor and to protect the forests that are remaining, whereas during the process of implementation, you may find it's necessary to look at how many farmers have been brought into a process of PES or other kinds of activities that will nourish the kind of reduction in pressure on forests that you want to protect. In an output phase, you're more concerned about your activities actually resulting in a reduction of pressure at the, uh, uh, within the forests that are within the, frame, within the boundaries of the area that you're trying to protect. Have those activities actually resulted in a reduction in pressure? And, but only in the outcome phase, which may be 10 years or more down the pike, uh, and in a very long, long process, we may, may be able to be able to say what the impact of a red plus 
program is in terms of avoiding deforestation and actually reducing the carbon emissions that have gone into the atmosphere and actually resulted in climate change. So the impact on climate is really only going to be felt in the very long term. So I just wanted to look at the idea of forest carbon projects as one kind of project that could be developed and then evaluated in terms of its measurable benefits in terms of retaining carbon in the landscape or sequestering carbon through growth in restored forests. These actions should then be considered additional to those that would have occurred in the absence of the project for them to justify being a part of a red project. If they're just business as usual, you know, nobody's really taking down the forest, so why are we investing in carrying out these kind of activities? This kind of criticism has been raised in some, some parts of the Amazon, for example, in which there really isn't that much pressure on uh, taking down the forest as there would be in a frontier area like uh, the southern Amazon or the eastern Amazon, where there's pastures being brought into areas that are still pristine, and there's a lot of forest burning going on, and a lot of deforestation is still underway. Another objective that we sh should be established is that these activities should bring permanent results. You shouldn't reforest an area and then five years down the road say, oh, I, well, I like this area, but I really like to sell the timber and use it to buy seeds so I can make more pasture. We want to look at a situation in which people have become committed to retaining a forest uh, over the foreseeable future. Uh, and if they have to be motivated by direct payments to sustain the forest intact. There were a bunch of different goals set up by Red Plus that have to be evaluated each in their own right and not only according to the same yardstick. But if we want to look at carbon, we want to look at the evaluation of how much carbon there is in the forest. So we look at a situation ex ante, the initial phase, in which uh, we're looking at a forest that perhaps has been degraded over time. And what we want to see in the long term is that the forest is going to be recovered through reforestation or through natural regeneration, or a situation with, in which the project would not have taken place in which there would be even less forest. So there's two scenarios that are being evaluated against each other. And we want to see well, what does it take to get to the with project situation versus the without the project, and how are you going to measure the benefits? So the benefits in this case are going to be looked at as being the difference between the amount of carbon that is in the forest with the project that is projected to have been the result of, of not having a project. You want to try to project a situation of continuing degradation in which there is a loss of the amount of carbon that is in the landscape over time and compare that with the situation in which you're providing for improved carbonization of the landscape through reforestation or regeneration or just retention of what's there. These are approaches that, uh, that are giving us a, a basis for measurement of the actual benefits in terms of carbon of the investment in Red Plus projects.